Greetings, everyone. I am incredibly excited today to be talking with Keoni Hanale, who is the founder of Pohala Botanicals and an incredible, you've been described as an alchemist. You're a medicine person. I see you as an incredible wisdom keeper and a descendant of the Mu people. So tell us a little bit about your lineage, and then I'd love to get into conversation with you about your incredible work with ferns and fern medicinals, and also talk about the energy of the sacred masculine and sacred feminine and how you're working with that. But part of why I'm so excited to talk with you, Keone, is first of all, I have profound respect for you from our interactions across these last few years. And part of what I think is profound is your courage and your uh, commitment to bringing the ancient wisdom of your lineage forward in this time. Because I truly believe as we're moving into the Aquarian age, for us to heal, we need to remember the ancient wisdom the meaning of being in right relationship in order to let go of these destructive power over paradigms and come back into balance, come back into the nature of what it truly means for us to be human. And so much of your work is about holding that ancient wisdom and helping us heal in this time. So thank you for that. Oh, mahalo. Thank you so much, Heather. It, this is such an honor, and I'm I'm so eager and so excited to to share with you and to this audience. I also have a deep, profound respect for you, a uh, follower uh, and a recipient of your wisdom and your medicine for quite some time now. And um, it's people like you who truly inspire uh, the many of us to also come out of our certain levels of hiding and just begin to share our translation of what it means to be a human being. And so thank you so much for being a leader in this, my sister. I um, was so fortunate to be birthed into the culture to which I'm from, it's Mu Hawaiian. And perhaps some people, when they hear Mu, uh, it's unlocatable, but perhaps if I say the word Lemuria, then it becomes a little more uh, familiar. Um, Mu is pre-Polynesian Hawaiian culture. And so what this means is that I have access to my lineage that spans before the Tahitians arrived in Hawaii about 2000 years ago. In fact, the lineage to which I come from, we have access to uh, the doctrines and to the mo'olelo or the stories that spans 1017 generations. This takes us to the year 18,000 BC. And we have access to this because um, we have something called an Oli Helu, or it's a genealogical chant. And in this chant, uh, we visit each generation and we resurrect a name, we resurrect qualities of that name. And that takes us to the founder of the contemporary lineage, whose name is Mahat. Mahat lived in 18,000 BC and resurrected the lineage. And when I say contemporary, 18,000 BC, it seems so prehistoric. <laughs> it's uh, contemporary because we know we've been here for a lot longer than 18,000 BC. From what my family have gathered in that, why did it start in 18,000 BC? It's likely because prior to 18,000 BC, there is some kind of cataclysm and it took humanity hundreds of thousands of years, perhaps, to recover from the cataclysm. And 18,000 BC, my ancestor, Mahat, was the one who resurrected the lineage and began to share once again of the doctrines of not just our family, but of our perception of humanity and consciousness itself. My grandmother, Kawiki Onalani, was a well-known makaula or mystic on the island of Maui, and that's where I reside. Um, it's my pico. It's the place of, of my essence, Maui. It's my house of power as well. And upon birth, I was uh, adopted, for, formally adopted in a traditional way by my grandmother so that I could uh, receive the mo'olelo or the stories of my family and that I could absorb um, that knowledge. Um, <clears throat> 
So I, I, I love to say, Heather, that the first five years of my life with my grandmother was just one beautiful ceremony. And in the traditional Hanai, after you've been uh, indoctrinated and you've remembered the lineage, it's traditional for you to return to your parents. And so I returned to my parents. However, my parents lived a very Western lifestyle. And so I became immersed in, in this very modern Western life. And I learned that that to who uh, I remembered myself to be uh, in those first five years was not compatible to the Western world. And so I learned really quickly how to hide and how to conform. And so I rejected all the knowledge that my, my grandmother, Kawiki Onalani, reminded me of. It wasn't until I reached different levels of trauma in my own life that I realized that I, I, I could locate my kiakahi, as we say in our culture. And kiakahi means purpose, means purpose. And in one of the throes of, of my greatest traumas and the exhaust of subordination and the exhaust of conforming and, and just living completely inauthentically, uh, I said, I'm available for a vision. I'm at the point of breaking. I'm available for a vision. And I just left it at that. I didn't have any expectations. I didn't try to orchestrate it at all. I'm just available for a vision. And beautifully a vision arrived and it was my grandmother's hands mm-hmm. and I'm aware you know speaking poetry <laughs> right the, the the language of nature itself the poetry I I translated that poetry and it said your kiakahi is all that which your grandmother offered you mm-hmm. and it was that moment that I made a commitment and a dedication to lean into my kiakahi into my purpose and that's what I've been doing ever since. This has been about seven years now that I've been in this resurrection and reaffirmation and reorientation into my authentic self. And what's profound about that, Keone, is that you now can be a bridge person because you really understand and were immersed in the modern world and the, our culture of disconnection. But now in your own returning to that ancient wisdom and your true self, you're an incredible translator to help those of us who need to wake up and come back into that consciousness of what it means to be truly human. You know how to help move between the worlds and guide people. Oh, thank you for, for pointing that out. And I, I would agree, Heather, because, you know, there's, when it comes to proper influence and how to be influential, it really comes down to relatability and being relatable. Relatability is one of the most powerful invitations. And then a conversation can begin and then a negotiation will follow. And in that negotiation, that's where power is met with power. So nothing is overpowered. Mm, Beautiful. And we want to get into talking about Haumea too, but talk some about the fern medicine. I was fascinated with some of what you teach about ferns, how ancient they are in their form, in their medicine, and how they connect with working with the different human emotions. Yes, yes. So in our Olihelu, when we go all the way back to 18,000 BC, and we uncover characteristics of Mahat, by the way, Mahat, that name literally translates to total oracle, total oracle. In my culture, um, because there's this glitch known as amnesia, what we do is we code our purpose in our own name. So if we do experience the throes of amnesia, all we need to do is translate our name, and it reorients us back into our kiyokahi. So Mahat, total oracle. So completely embodied his name. He pulled through and channeled that to which we thought was lost forever and brought it back out into relevance and into practicality as well. Um, And one of the things that um, Mahat resurrected and that Mahat itself, himself, um, was held in is something known as Pua Ehu Ehu. Pua Ehu Ehu. It's fern medicine. And because my family, we have access to the actual date 
and the location of this plant medicine that dates to 18,000 BC it would make it one of the oldest plant medicines known to man. Hua Ehu Ehu is all about emotional intelligence. And this is like a hot topic right now. What is emotional intelligence? I would like to translate it by way of how my lineage translates emotional intelligence. It's all about voltage. Voltage. The human experience is electrical. It's electrical. And the most powerful and potent stimulant and stimulus of our electrical experience as human beings is our emotions. And so emotional intelligence is about being able to speak fluently our voltage. There are 103 native Hawaiian ferns that correlate to 103 human emotions. In the spores of the ferns, hold the codes of these uncorrupt emotions or these voltages. And the way that this came about, this is in our lore, is when we went into this, this dark age, this spiritual dark age, there was a lot of concern that the emotions or the voltage would become corrupted. And so there was uh, this rally to preserve the human emotion. And there's something unique about ferns. Ferns are the only known organic species on this planet that has achieved evolutionary stasis, meaning they have met their evolutionary ceiling. They're completely evolved. The important thing about this is that because they are completely evolved, they are no longer required to accumulate data. You and I, we're evolving and it's beautiful, but, but because we're evolving, look at all the data that we are susceptible to, that we must filter, that we must discern. And the energies that we are impacted by and absorb. Absolutely. Absolutely. And isn't there something about the ferns that they have a, an energy field around themselves that is kind of like a protective energy field? Yes. It's this very, it's this very mysterious force field that surrounds them that it's as if they're being incubated in something that allows them to be uncorrupted, uncorrupted. And if we feel into what truly that means, uh, evolutionary stasis, it means something is completely positioned in their homeostasis, homeostasis. And my goodness, the power that that can incite, right? They call it aura. Some people call it aura. And so perhaps that force field is just the fern's aura because it is in its homeostasis. And so the ferns, they volunteered. They said, we agree. The human emotion it is so important. Voltage, it has the power to create and collapse a universe. And because we are part of this universe and we are part of this earth, we would not like this to collapse. And so we will preserve the human emotions until the time is hemolele or perfect for it to be reintroduced and re re integrated and then expressed in its purity once again. And so for all this time, Heather, in, in what is known as the Kali Yuga, um, the ferns have been preserving the human emotions as to ensure that they do not become corrupted and also to ensure that they don't destroy our universe. And I feel like this is so in, in relation to the threshold of Aquarius we're in right now and this energy of intellect with Aquarius and not just intellect, but as the bearer, right? The distribution of intellect, which is happening right now. Well, and I would even say, Keone, that Aquarius and the water bearer is actually at the deepest level, not about intellect, but about energy, mm. living energies of the cosmos. And it feels like these ferns, and I, I, I love your description of them holding that wisdom through the Kali Yuga, the time of our forgetting, the time of our disconnection, in order to be supporting us now on the cusp of the age of Aquarius to remember, to come back into connection again, come back into that wisdom that we have forgotten in order to understand who we are as energy beings, mm. including this whole spectrum of human emotions. Ooh, 
Yes. Yes. Thank you for, for also sharing that about the energy because, you know, we, we are all here to simply become an energetic match to that, which is most sacred an energetic match. And I love the way that you just shared that because it's as if the ferns are now revealing, right? They're releasing the spores, releasing the, the information and the data of these emotions, because perhaps we all are at this moment now, finally an energetic match to reconnect to that source, that source energy. And I love you, you use this term a lot, aloha ma. Yes. We're actually here that, that that's the energy of self-reflective love. Yes. And would you say that the firm medicine are helping us to come back into that consciousness of who we can be as beings of love reflecting back the love and wisdom and energy of the cosmos? I feel that profoundly. And, you know, like when we feel into self-reflective love, when I feel into self-reflective love, it's really the circumnavigation of my entire experience. It's that sacred circle, that sacred sphere. And within the, the voltage of the human emotions, creating a rotation of that mm -hmm. and an oscillation of that. And this is really also a return into the recognition and acceptance of quantum because quantum, it, it is, it just is, but the recognition and the acceptance of it, because when we are in our aloha ma, when I am in my aloha ma, that circumnavigation, that revolution becomes so quick. In, initially, we can see the linear aspect because we can see point A to point B. We can see the direction that it's going. When an oscillation becomes so rapid and so quick, when we are in absolute acceptance, especially absolute acceptance of my sacredness and that I belong. I belong in my sacredness, right? In the middle of that sphere, I belong. Mm. That sphere is oscillating so rapidly, you can't see the direction anymore. It's just a beam of light. And for us, and, and perhaps those who are familiar with um, Hawaiian culture, we have the sacred bowl of light. And the goal of the bowl of light is to only see the illumination, to only see and recognize the illumination. That can only happen when we satiate the linear, when we allow that linear to be in an oscillation that is so quick and so fast, you cannot locate its movement. It just relaxes into quantum. It's extraordinary. It's about being in true alignment. Yes. And and it feels like when you talk about that bowl of light, it reminds me of a lot of the shamanic training that I've had, which is about how we need to face and release our heaviness and what would block us or constrict us from being the beings of light that we're capable of. You know, the Peruvian shamans talk about our becoming homo luminous ones. But it feels like what you're describing with that bowl of light is how do we radiate our true essence in our embodiment? Mm -hmm. and, and one of the things that you've said, Kayoni, that I think is really profound is ascension is not transcendence. It's completion. Yes. It's coming into wholeness. Yes. And it feels like that's what you're describing in terms of that complete alignment in that sphere and being the being of light. Yes. <laughs> and we have documented uh, one of the most uh, famous prophets uh, alludes to this, Jesus uh, on the crossing. The last word that Jesus said was titelestai, and it means it is accomplished. It is completed. Mm, wow. Wow. This is extraordinary. So, in terms of the medicinals that you work with, with the ferns, are they awakening those emotions in us or balancing those aspects of us so that we can move into wholeness? Yes. And thank you for, for initiating this, because this is really important, especially when we work with organic, holistic plant medicine, is that it's based on a negotiation. And this is why natural remedies do not work for many people and they must resort to synthetic medication is because they're not approaching it in the awareness that it's a negotiation. And so when we work with the ferns, when I work with the ferns, 
first I introduce myself. That's something that is rarely ever done when people uh, uh, greet a medicine. First mm -hmm. introduce myself and then I share very personal aspects of myself and then my objectives, my, my goals. I, I must expose myself. And then the plant medicine, that's the invitation for it to negotiate with me. And so it does require that effort and that care to meet a plant medicine where I'm at and where it's at. Power must be met with power. Otherwise, something will become overpowered. Oh, Keone, that's beautiful. It, you know, when when I work with plants, you know, coming out of my own version of herbal training, it, it's about developing a relationship. Otherwise, we're treating that plant as if it's an object a commodity, we're violating its consciousness, its essence. So to me, it's it's so much about coming to the plant and honoring its consciousness, coming from a place of respect and honoring and asking permission and entering into that right relationship with the plant in order then to, you know, be in that process of opening to the healing and the medicine that it has to offer. But it feels mm. like it's so deeply, that's so deeply a part of your process. Yes, yes. And, and, and also, I, I am of the evidence of that, you know, I had stage four embryonal carcinoma, I had terminal cancer. And, and the medical professionals uh, concluded that hospice was was my path. And that's not my story. <laughs> no. <laughs> and but luckily for me, uh, I was already versed in what my grandmother taught me about the negotiation with the plant spirits and the remedies of the plant spirits, and that it begins in first uh, introduction, an invitation, and then an allowance. And and uh, I uh, attest my uh, remission for over ten years now. I attest uh, my recovery and my thriving because of my relationship with plant medicine. Wow, that is profound, truly profound. And it, it feels like that was a part of your own transformational process to be coming back into your true authentic self, your true purpose. Most certainly, like, like I was sharing in the beginning of our conversation, there are certain traumas that came to visit me. That, that was one of them. And, and I think they are sometimes wake up calls for us or, yes. or the way in which the cosmos or, you know, the divine energies are telling us when we're out of alignment with who we truly are. But that's, that's profound how you worked that, Keone. It I, I just wanted to share that because thank you for saying that, Heather, because there is something that 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 cancer, that illness was saying to me. And I thought it was just like, am I a masochist? But it was saying, I do this because I love you. Mm. I do this because I love you. And it gave me that choice point of how I was going to reorient myself. And so speaking into how these are these sacred wake up calls that are disguised as things that can be so horrific. Well, I so, so respect you and how you've done your process. And it, it reminds me, Keone, of this point in my life where I was really out of balance. And I got this very strong uh, message from spirit, you need to leave your life as you've known it, or you will die. And I had a very clear vision of example, exactly the cancer that I would get and the course of the trajectory of the life that I would be on, the path that I would be on. And it was such a wake up call for me that to come back into balance, come back into alignment with my true purpose. But, it, you know, those crises are intense. But to me, it was an opening to transformation. Mm, wow. Such a beautiful story, Heather. And also uh, how your skill of premonition and, and what a great example, too, of the of the skill of premonition and also how inconvenient and how uncomfortable premonitions come through. I feel that's why many of us reject it, but you, you leaned into the premonition and then acted accordingly. As did you in your own <laughs> journey. 
Ernie and, and talk some about Haumea, because you and I've talked about this before we got on the video about how profound her energy is in this time for us collectively, because this is a huge crisis point, trauma point for us collectively. And Pluto squaring the lunar nodes, we need to wake up yeah. and be in a process of transformation like we've just described we went through individually. We need to do that collectively. It, it's a choice point. And Haumea is right on the South Node trying to guide us in what we need to do energetically to heal, to move in to new directions and new paradigms. But you're so intimately connected with her and her medicine and her energy. So share some of that with us. I would love to. Haumea is one of the most beloved uh, deities, entities, energies of my culture, of the Hawaiian culture. Uh, most often seen as the primary feminine energy or the primary mother. It has everything to do with regeneration. Regeneration. And then when we go into perhaps the, the intellectual aspect of regeneration, we are talking about replication and what we are choosing to replicate. And because Haumea is positioned um, and identified as female, as feminine, this also means that the approach into regeneration and replication is fair. That's one of the most potent and powerful things of my personal feminine, my internal feminine, but the feminine as a whole. It's the energy that is versed in the fluency of fairness. That's why the feminine also governs community. And so Haumea gives us the choice point, just as you're sharing. What would you like me to replicate? Hmm. What would you like me to replicate? Um, one of the skills of Haumea, she has uh, something called the, the makale. It's a magic stick. And she uses this magic stick uh, to transform things, most notably herself. Hmm. So the, and, and just, just to share the magic stick actually correlates to broomsticks in, in a lot of the, the witch cultures and especially popular culture of, of witchcraft and the broomstick, because the magic stick and the broomstick actually correlates to a uh, bolt of voltage, voltage. You're carried and you're commanding with voltage, mm. with the voltage. And then that correlates right to that emotional experience as well. Mm. And what we are culminating and creating as the voltage to which we offer as an output. So what Haumea does is she offers offspring based upon the instructions that she's receiving. What would you like me to replicate? Mm. She takes that because she's fair, even if it's like, I don't like that. <laughs> That doesn't sound good to me, but she's fair. She's saying, this is the fairness. This is the verdict. So I will now replicate that. And she offers that. She honors the linear because she must be relatable to humankind. So she honors the linear, just like you and I, we all age. She will allow herself to age and she will age until she's an old woman. And then she will take the makale, the magic stick, her voltage, and she will position herself back, shapeshift back into a young woman. At that time, she will ask again, what shall I replicate? Based mm -hmm. upon what she receives, she will offer that. She will age with us. She will experience that with us. She does not abandon us. She is a true mother, a true mother. She experiences the consequences with us. And she goes through this cycle over and over again, transforms herself back into a young woman where she's fertile. And she asks again, what shall I replicate? Oh, wow. That is extraordinary, Keone. It feels as if she guides us and midwifes us through the process of birth, life, death, rebirth. Yes. He's she's a true mother guiding us in that journey of our own growth and evolution as we move through those different phases. Yes. Yes. And she, she teaches a lot. Like, you know, my grandmother was very influenced by Haumea because my grandmother, the, the method to which my grandmother taught me was, and this is very Haumea esque is my grandmother would not say yes or no to me. 
regardless of how potentially dangerous it was, <laughs> she would not say yes or no to me. She would wait until whatever I did was done. Then she would come to me and she would say, boy, how did that make you feel? Mm. Based upon how that makes you feel, choose how you will proceed. Incredible wisdom. So helping you both experience how that's impacting you, but really gain your own conscious awareness, your own capacity to reflect on your choices. To meet power with power so nothing is overpowered. Hmm. And this this is a good segue then into how, how your understanding, because the age of Aquarius is so much about rebalancing the sacred masculine and the sacred feminine. It's like we've been in this period where they've gotten so out of balance and that part of Haumea, part of the energies of the sacred feminine are guiding us back into fairness, which to me also means balance, coming back into harmony. But your understanding of that is truly profound and and is a way of holding those energies and bringing them back into balance that I've never heard before. So I'd love for you to share some of your wisdom about that. Oh, yes. Thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, And, you know, this is also what was taught to me and what I was reminded by my own lineage and and the Oli Helu that spans to Mahat. Um, But in order to understand the whole human, of course, first, I'm in recognition that although I may be a a gendered male, I'm 100% masculine and I'm 100% feminine. I do not favor either one of my energies. If I favor something, the other is going to be neglected. And so I am in recognition and acceptance that I'm 100% feminine and 100% masculine. Okay. So what does that mean now? First, Um, I'm going to tap into my feminine and we do this. And I do this by understanding the function of my centers, the function of my feminine and the function of my masculine and the feminine uh, correlates a lot to, to what I was sharing with, with Haumea, because the feminine governs what is known as the po'ai, the po'ai. And if I were to translate po'ai, it means domain or coven, coven. The feminine is my noun, and therefore it's that to which establishes me. That's why we say earth mother. It establishes me. In the feminine is where we reconcile safety. It is within one's establishment do we feel safe because establishment also means I belong. I belong. That is the first awareness. I belong. I'm not confused about that. I'm safe in my belonging. Yes, there will be distractions. Yes, there will be things that will attempt to topple my awareness of my safety. But I am in my establishment. I am in my my domain. My feminine is my now. It that to which establishes. Only then can we truly rise to the occasion of knowing and resourcing the function of the masculine because the masculine must have a firm foundation. Mm -hmm. If we feel the masculine as an architect and an engineer, it's that to which translates the energy of God or the energy which does not have form yet. The masculine translates it into structures. That's why it's the engineer, the architect. It takes the energy of God and says, I will discern what the energy of God looks like, sounds like, tastes like, feels like. When I go to a rose and I smell the rose, I know very well that that rose is offering its translation of God. And so we are also doing that. If the masculine does not have a firm foundation, how can it construct something with longevity? Mm -hmm. If it's governed in urgency, hysteria, crisis, Mm -hmm. What is it going to construct under that kind of condition? Mm -hmm. I always say, if the masculine feels safe, it is receiving the safety of its feminine. It is laying in the coven of the feminine, in the oracle. Mm -hmm. 
it turns from being a simple engineer and an architect into an artist, Mm. an artist. And now we are all showing up in our artistry. This is so important for the masculine right now in patriarchy because the masculine is so intellectual that it's just objective thinking. I got to do this next, next, next. It's not held in meaning. Mm -hmm. It's the artistry that will infuse our internal masculine with the meaning once again, so that we design the beautiful things that are most honest to the instructions that is coming from that safety of our feminine. Mm. So it sounds like you're saying the feminine is the noun and the masculine is the verb. Is exactly. the, and, and part of what I think you're describing that we've gotten out of balance is if you separate the energy of the masculine from that foundation and the sacred feminine, it it can spin off into this unbalanced way of generating what it's 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 action but it's losing that sense of safety it's losing that sense of balance it's losing that right relationship with the sacred feminine and it sounds like you're also talking about the balance of embodiment you know really embracing our embodiment and our transcendence that we need to really hold them in balance. Most certainly. And and in mutual admiration, mutual, it's the greatest romance between my feminine and my masculine to be in mutual admiration where there is no other interest, but to extract the highest qualities from one another. And then that also mirrors with our relationships with other human beings, our relationship with other plant life and other species, our relationship with the planet, our relationship to the universe. I am simply here to extract the highest qualities and allow myself to be extracted of my highest qualities. One, because I feel safe. I belong. My feminine is established and my masculine is creating results of that safety. Now there's evidence. There's the sacred confidence. The masculine is no longer arrogant. It's confident because it is creating the results that honor that sacredness of the feminine. It's so beautiful to hear you describe that, Kayoni. And it reminds me, I've heard you say in in another context, you've talked about how destructive competition is. You've described it as mutually traumatizing. And that true collaboration is what you were just beautifully describing, that way in which in in our differentness, we mirror each other and draw out the best in each other, celebrate that creativity and that uniqueness of the other, rather than it being a power struggle. Yes, Heather. And I, I like to share it like this, just to further clarify uh, competition. Okay. And, and I'll speak from my own experience. Because um, there was a time in my life where I thought competition had to be the loudest thing for me. I I really thought I was in survival, non-essential survival. So if my day, if I wake up and my entire day is in the interest of competition, that means I'm arrogant. Mm -hmm. And that's juvenile masculine, juvenile masculine. That means I'm arrogant, juvenile masculine. Of course, that means there's a lot of insecurity. However, if I have tapped into the coven of my feminine, my day becomes more in the interest of contribution, contribution, not competition, contribution. That is the definition of confidence. Mm. Confidence means I'm showing up with a contribution. I'm just here to share. I'm just here to offer, to participate, to engage. I'm not here to compete. How did you begin to find that foundation of the sacred feminine in yourself? Because you're you're really describing how much that's associated with safety and the sense of the inner security of the sense of self and of embodiment to then be in that artistry of creation and expression. I tell you, Heather, it, it, 
was incited by exhaust. <laughs> <laughs> it just became the exhaustion of imbalance. <laughs> yeah, it was so exhausting waking up being like, who am I going to have to compete with today? Mm-hmm. What am I going to have to hoard today? And then finally, I'm like, whoa, let's just pivot. Let's just pivot. How much of this is essential? The only reason why I should ever truly compete when it's non-playful is if my life is in imminent danger. Right now, is my life in imminent danger? Okay, Oni, do you have access to food? Yeah. Do you have access to water? Mm -hmm. Do you have access to shelter? I do. Okay, let's go further, Keoni. Is the food, shelter, and water of high quality? It is. Why are you in crisis? (laughs) So that competition comes from a scarcity mentality and a survival mentality. Yes. And also, and also uh, a big story with me is, is reasons for me to isolate reasons for me to isolate. And finally, when I positioned myself in my feminine and I became just realistic, realistic about my immediate environment, I began to breathe deeper because, okay, right now my life is in in imminent danger. I, I can project if I leave my front door, it might be, but right now it's, it's not okay. And I just begin to breathe into it. And that's how the feminine coached me. It says, now we're going to leave the front door and we're just going to look around. We're going to base all of our choices on actual experiences, not projections. That's why the masculine is linear. The masculine loves to project. It loves to idealize. The feminine in that quantum field is all about what we are experiencing right now. That's why my kupuna, my grandmother would say, how does that make you feel? Mm-hmm. Base your decision on how it makes you feel. Feminine model, how may I model? And so my feminine just taught me, okay, now we're going to get in the car. <laughs> Now we're going to go to the grocery store, right? In the present moment. Yep. Yep. And I noticed that safety is transportable because it's me. It's me. No matter where I go, I belong. My feminine kept telling me that. Notice at the end of the day, my feminine would say, notice everywhere we went. And of course, she's speaking directly to my masculine, right? In in such a loving way. But she's saying, notice everywhere we went, we are transportable. We belong. Okay, so the myth, I just busted the myth. <laughs> the letting go of the projections and the survival mentality and the fear, actually. That's so much of, I think, what's playing out in such a destructive way in the collective consciousness right now is the level of fear. And when we're caught in fear, we lower our vi- vibration and we give our power away. Yes. The other piece I'm getting, and this circles back to Haumea, is it feels like part of the safety with connecting to the feminine and really honoring that foundation is the awareness that we're not alone. We are connected. We are in relationship. Haumea is saying, I'm with you every phase of the journey and holding you, loving you, being with you guiding you you're not alone yes and that's why the the feminine will insist as well that we are here to make contributions contributions and so in my need and my seduction to isolate my feminine kept saying would you like to contribute today Mm -hmm. and just kept saying that over and over and over again today will you contribute today are you going to contribute And so we are here and the feminine will remind us this is about making contributions. It's not just about being here in a a, a, a self, uh, I don't even know the word, Heather, but, uh, you know, like a a type of just uh, non-communal experience. Yeah, being separate and caught in our own ego without being in connection, in relationship, aware of how we're impacting everyone around us, how we're contributing or how we're exploiting or destroying. Yes, yes, thank you. I mean, that feels like some of the power of your grandmother's wisdom. How did that make you feel? So that we begin to see how our choices not only impact ourselves, but impact others. And how are we in right relationship or out of right relationship with ourselves and with each other 
and with all of the life around us. Yes, yes. Powerful, beautiful. Well, you have a very um, powerful meditation that you work with in terms of this. And I wonder if that would be a good way for us to close this time together. I would love to do that. Thank you so much. In the culture of Mu, we have an ancient greeting that's called Kulike. And Kulike means to stand tall. And uh, we're referring energetically to stand tall as the pillar that we are established in the safety of the feminine and invigorated in the confidence and the integrity of the masculine. Uh, we have our hands that go into two different positions to honor the feminine and the masculine. And um, there's a little breathing that goes into this and I'm going to guide all of us. So if we all will just close your eyes. The first thing that I do in Kulike is I land. Let's all land. When I feel into landing, I am removing myself of fixations of a past and cravings for a future. I deem this current moment sufficient. For me, there's nothing more interesting than this current moment. At my huelo, my tailbone, I feel this very generous tug. This tug, also known as sacred gravity, is connecting me to the iron crystal core of this planet. I remember that my relationship with this planet is not a punishment, nor is it an imprisonment. I remember that this has been designed in mutual consent, and I am one of its engineers. I choose to land. Only in this landing can we make contact with these two very important energy centers. First, I'll ask that we all just lift our right hand. In lifting our right hand, we are in recognition of the uhane, the internal masculine. Let's restore the uhane to its rightful throne, that of the pu'uvai or the heart space. Let's place that right hand over our heart. Let's you and I take a deep breath in through the nose and hold. Holding this breath, applying this oxygen in the pu'uvai. Let's fill that chamber with oxygen. And exhale through the mouth. In this exhalation, feeling the relaxation of the internal masculine removed of urgency and belligerency, restored as the hero. Here in the Pu'uvai, I offer a mantra of our hero. Pa vale Pu'uvai. I open my heart wider. Mahalo, uhane, and I love you. Keeping our right hand over our heart, let's now make contact with the unihipili, our internal feminine. Let's lift our left hand. Let's restore the unihipili, our feminine, to its rightful throne, that of the na'au or the sacral. Let's place that left hand over our sacral. Let's you and I take a deep breath in through the nose and hold. Holding this breath, applying this oxygen in the sacral. Let's fill that chamber with oxygen. And exhale through the mouth. In this exhalation, feeling the proliferation of the internal feminine, removed of subordination, neglect, obscurity, restored as the leader. Here in the Na'au, I offer a mantra of our leader. Ua Malu. I am safe. Mahalo. Unihipili. And I love you. And now that our hands are in the proper position known as Kulike, a moment to integrate this right relation between the noun and the verb the intention and the manifestation, the dream and the action.
and my friends, we honor this kulike by uttering three times, aloha ma, aloha ma, aloha ma. Mahalo. Profound, mm. Keone. Thank you. You can feel the integration, the coming into balance, coming into oneness. Mm. Thank you for being in this conversation today. Thank you for the healing energies that you're emanating and the wisdom that you're bringing to us in this time and the way you're honoring the wisdom of your lineage. Thank you. It is my great honor and my great jubilation and, and enthusiasm to play with all of you in our mutual extraction of our highest qualities. I celebrate each and every one of you. And I celebrate you, Sister Heather. Aloha ma. Mm, aloha ma. Aloha ma to all of you. Blessings.